I want to get into the secret sauce of how you craft a vision and a story. I think the most important thing is showing instead of telling. In this episode, we dive into the vision and strategy with Carol, a product design leader who made waves at companies like Shopify and Personio. Carol has successfully driven impactful design initiatives by aligning the business value with design. How much one click can change the efficiency of an entire company? Identifying those moments was really helpful and immerse ourselves into our uh, customers' day-to-day -day operations. So join us as we explore how to build a compelling design vision and master the art of storytelling. I always start with the problem and once I have the problem statement, I try to add data. In the very best case, we know what impact does that have on the bottom line of the business. I hope you enjoy. Hey, Carol, welcome to the show. Hey, Ren. So I'm Carol. I'm a product designer from Germany, and I've been a designer for a very long time. I think I started in 2007 as a graphic designer. But at some point in my career, I figured that's definitely not what I want to do for the rest of my life. At this point, I thought websites are the cool thing and I really wanted to go into web design and do animated stuff and stuff that moves and not only is printed. Then I had a very lucky encounter with an agency that did software, like custom software for SMBs. And it was really interesting because we solved very little problems for very small companies, so it was very simple. But I could really feel how much we improved the people's lives and uh, operations. And in the beginning, I thought this is super boring. I don't want to do software. But after the first one or two projects, I really thought this is amazing. It was very different from graphic design and web design. But I decided to double down on that and stayed with this agency for some time because it was a really good environment to learn on the job. And then I met the founders of Fleetbird, which is today known as Bunda Mobility, which was my first full-time tech job. We were just six people when I joined. And when I left, I think we were around 150 people. We got acquired. And from there, I moved to Shopify, where we met. And now you're at Personio and leading the product design effort there. Uh, yeah, not the entire, but for the automations team, which is a strategic priority for the company. It's a small but mighty team and also growing team. So look up Personio. There's some nice. Yeah, it, it's very fascinating that you have worked at almost all the different type of environments, like you're in an agency. And then you're in super early startup and going through an acquisition. Then this massive organization like Shopify and then now back to Personio, which is kind of this growth stage, yeah. late stage startup. Yeah. It's very interesting to see all those different stages because I think the requirements for the job are very different for each stage in this early stage where you need to wear all of the hats and be a graphic designer and a product designer, a bit of a product manager, or at Shopify, where you really need to specialize on one thing. And now for Sonia, it's a bit in between where you need to do a bit of the product management, but a lot of the UX craft as well. So I think it's very important to have seen it all. Yeah. Which uh, type of environment is your type of environment? Yeah. You know, when year ago, when Shopify laid off all of Germany, I was thinking about this a lot and I couldn't really answer the question for myself. I think I really like the early stage startup for just having so much impact on the product and on the direction the product can take in the future. Everything you touch will have immediate impact on the entire organization. But I also love in bigger organizations to be surrounded by a lot of talented designers and uh, product people you can learn from. And I think that is also why I choose Personio over roles at smaller companies, because I really, really feel that I can learn a lot from more senior designers that you just often don't have in the smaller or earlier stage companies. I think it now at the point in my career, that's exactly what I want to grow and to make the next step. I am back in the early stage startup world. We have 15 people, slightly larger than Fleetbird when you first joined. Yes, I definitely miss the collaborations with other designers or even product people. I am very jealous. Yeah, sometimes you uh, just hit a wall and you need someone to talk to that has 
the same or similar context on the problem space, it can be very challenging. I am interested in uh, dive deeper into your experience at Fleetbird. It sounds like this fantastic journey that not a lot of designers have experience with. You join when there are six people and then you grow into 150. So that's like a rocket ship, hyper growth, also acquisition, which is very rare. Yeah. So how is that experience like for you? Yeah, I think things just happened back then. I don't think that anyone planned on what will happen. Maybe a bit of context what Fleetbird really is. When I met the founders, they built a software for two very specific companies in Berlin doing scooter sharing and car sharing. Both companies exist until today and one is still using the software. So you can imagine this as an operating system for sharing companies where you can manage your vehicles, manage your stuff, your orders, your invoices, your customers. When I started, we had maybe one new customer a month and then it became a bit more frequent. And at some point, kick scooter became a thing, right? This Birds and limes and all those micro mobility services became suddenly popular and a lot of companies wanted to get into the sharing space. And we were the only ones to provide software for this. And we also figured that maybe we shouldn't only provide software, but also hardware because it was a very popular demand. We really tried to get our feed into many different facets of this business, mostly focusing obviously on the software side, but at the same time I was helping because I was the only designer with where do we get scooters from? How can we put branding on the scooters and working with different vendors to figure this out, which was very interesting. And since we onboarded not only one or two customers a month, but three to four a week, we became suddenly very popular for bigger companies who tried to get into different aspects of mobility, which is how we got to collaborate first with Bunda Mobility from Hamburg and they later acquired us. Things just happened in a way it was super fast. It was like in the span of a year where we had still so much to do on the software side, but it was a very reliable system, which helped us a lot in this growth journey and then became the cash making machine for Wunder Mobility after acquisition, because it was already a product that had proven product market fit. Finding this product market fit was really an interesting journey. It teached me a lot about how to connect business value and users needs. How have you worked with the founders at Fleetbird yeah. to um, kind of figure out? Yeah, I think that was for me the harder lesson than for the founders. For me, it was really, I was very naive back then. I had all those ideas on how to create a fancy white label app and how to redesign the whole admin interface. But I failed to make a case, why should we prioritize this over a new feature or something that helps win a customer? I really needed to learn to articulate my design decisions and things from the vision we've created into a priority. It's a strategic priority that helps the business moving forward. For a long time, I struggled a lot. I think what helped me was really visiting customers and seeing how they run their operations and really gain a deep understanding how, how struggling or how much you can struggle with things like a battery swap on a scooter, right? So. You'd think that's a simple thing, but people need to have a very efficient route through the city to go from one vehicle to the other without going back and forth. So every minute counts. You need to really keep um, vehicles operatable and rentable. And every minute you lose is just money the company loses. So once I understood better how manual a lot of those steps are, the easier it was for me to understand, okay, we should prioritize maybe this feature that it's maybe not fancy, but it will make them so much more efficient or help them unlock a vehicle faster, right? Like if you can unlock a vehicle with one click instead of having five clicks, that was really, really important. At the point where I really invested also in, or where we could invest in research, I was not the only designer. So it was very helpful to have someone helping with the field study and then also summarizing that while we could support all these tactical needs. But yeah, how much one click can change the efficiency of an entire company. Identifying those moments was really helpful and immerse ourselves into our uh, customers' day-to-day -day operations. That was incredibly important. And I think that is also what I'm struggling most with because it's hard sometimes to get into 
an HR company because they deal with personal data. Personal data in Europe is very much protected. Not that easy to just visit them and work with them for a day or two. So that is, I think, the most important thing is a deep, deep understanding of your, the day-to-day -day work of your customers and the people you're serving. Yeah, I love it. I'm a big proponent for user research. And I, I have to say, I love consumer B2B to see sort of companies where you can really go watch people. Yeah. I'm glad that your research really rooted in the consumer problems and that helps you prioritize. And I think that's a good segue to talk about how you share your vision because that's kind of the thing you are known for. Yeah. So I want to share this story with everyone, which is after I have left the growth team on Shopify and joined retail, working on very different product problems. And one day, everybody just suddenly started raving about this vision deck Carol created for one of, I think, monetization or yes. checkout. Yeah, and I am being in a completely different business unit at Shopify, such a huge word, and I've heard about it. The director of design, Darren, very high praise for that vision as well. And we were all told you should all be sharing out your vision like Carol. I want to get into the secret sauce of how you craft a vision and a story. Yeah, I think the most important thing is showing instead of telling. This vision deck you mentioned, um, at the beginning of 2021, um, our priority changed to capture more retail merchants, having bundles with the retail team and double down on upsells and cross-sells made a lot of sense to me in terms of monetization. But the subscription checkout was only designed for subscriptions. So there was no way to bundle things together. Some people might come from a campaign where we, where we would advertise Shopify basic plus POS pro a discounted price. We would first need to ask them to pay for the subscription. We would not be able to show them discount. Then only after they subscribe, we would show them retail offer, which I assumed cost us a lot of leads. A lot of people would never reach the moment where they would get the bundle and they would be disappointed because during the checkout, they wouldn't recognize it. I tried to write it down. I write a lot to sort my mind, to download my brain. I wrote everything down. I was thinking about this project and brought it to senior leadership. Everyone said, look, this is a topic for core. It's not growth work. We should not do the subscription checkout, which also made sense to me. But I still disagreed because I thought our strategy will underperform, not because the strategy is wrong, but because the execution, we just don't have the means to give merchants a good checkout experience. And I was also thinking Shopify has, has the best performing checkout on the internet already offering them to merchants. Why don't we use it ourselves? So I just, that was also very beneficial. I just took the checkout from the checkout team and I talked to them what they learned, what are the principles behind creating checkout experiences and just showed how could a checkout look like if we use our checkout system that we offer to buyers. And I think just showing what I mean, instead of just sharing a doc and saying, hey, look, this will not work, help people understand how much better this is, not only for the strategy, but for Shopify overall. And I think a similar approach I took at Wunder Mobility and I'm trying to take now on the automations team at Personio is really showing what I mean instead of just talking about it so that people can imagine and contribute to this idea, to this visual representation. So I was also on the retention team at Shopify and the retention team had no other surface than the exit flow. But when people decide to cancel their store, it's basically too late. Retention needs to start way earlier, but we had no surfaces where I could just show, hey, look, we improve the UX here or there by changing this component, changing the language. There was no way to show that. So the vision there was purely a storytelling exercise where we told the story of a merchant who tries and tries over and over again with different stores, because that's a common pattern across Shopify merchants to start over again. And making the experience between stores so much simpler, right? Because the whole setup in the beginning, if you have set up one store that did not work, you can still reuse a lot of the basic setup that you have done already. Like, how do you want to get paid? Your business address. You can reuse a lot of that. That's just lowering the barrier of creating another store. 
And I think all those things need to come together in one, one thing. So that needs to be rooted in research and a deep customer understanding. You need to connect it to the business value. Why is it important for the company you work for? What problem are you solving for the company and how does it scale? I think the strategy piece as well is really, really important. And I think you mentioned also Darren before, and Darren also helped me really understand, like he said, hey, look, we need to up-level the quality at Shopify through the board. Like it, the, the quality is not good enough. And what Darren was really good at is not only telling us, hey, the quality needs to be higher, but he had criteria for quality. So it needs to have utility, right? It needs to do the thing you intended to do. Usability needs to be there. So people need to know how to use the thing. It needs to be aesthetic because we as human beings are very aesthetic people and we are pleased to aesthetic things. And it needs to follow a strategy, it needs to contribute to a bigger whole. If you can make it tangible, if you can tell a story from your customer's perspective and make it tangible in the form of a prototype or a storytelling exercise, like a video or whatever the right format is for you, then you have a good chance of making this thing reality because then people will know, okay, this is the end goal. We are working towards this. And here's the first increment we want to build now to bring us closer. One thing you mentioned earlier is you start by writing down story, like yeah. download from your brain. I wonder if there is a go-to story arc or a template that you use for the different visions. The process I normally follow is that I really first write down in the most messy way everything I have in, on my mind, what is top of mind when I think about a certain problem. It's mostly just a bulleted list and it's super scrappy written. And then I try to rewrite my bullets and order them, like just bring them in some logical sequence to have the starting point. Now with ChatGPT and Claude and all the other AI tools we have, it became way more easier because I can just feed them my bullets and say, look, help me write a paragraph from it. And then I have a starting point. And I always start with the problem. And once I have the problem statement, which is mostly like two or three sentences, I try to add data we have. It can be qualitative data we have from interviews. In the best case, we have quantitative data. And in the very best case, we know what impact does that have on the bottom line of the business. That's not always available, but that's often also fine. If you can just prove that a lot of customers share the same pain or struggle with what you try to solve, then often this is enough. And then I try to lay out, okay, what are the opportunities I see here to improve this experience? And what are the assumptions we are making? Because the assumptions are very important to then really test, is this even going in the right direction? And, um, really be clear, look, if we ship this, this is what we try to prove by this. This can be a qualitative test. It can be a quantitative test. It's also depending on the company. And then based on those opportunities, I try to bring this all together into this bigger goal where I try to be very ambitious when it comes to UI and interaction patterns, but still give the opportunity to break it down into smaller pieces that are closer to what we have today. Yeah, I appreciate you list out your assumptions because I've seen like staff designer, principal designers, very senior, they kind of uh, stand in a very opinionated way. They're like, this is the vision. This is what we should be doing. But I, I appreciate that you have a very growth design oriented way by listing out the assumption and you're calling out these are my assumptions and we should test these. So that kind of take the discussion from UI details to just do you agree with the premise yeah. of this whole thing first? It's also like the tedious part of this exercise probably, but I think it's super important because as you said, it is good to be opinionated. I think it is really important to be opinionated when you create software, but it's also important to have the right opinions. And that's what I struggle mostly with. I really want to make sure we are spending our time to deliver the highest value we can, especially in smaller teams. And also now at Personio, it's more people than at Fleetbird back then, but it's still small teams. And we really need to deliver impact fast to prove like this business unit has, has a meaning to, to Personio's business. So listing out those questions and the assumptions you're making helps you really detaching, as you said, your personal stance and just, hey, look, 
this is my opinion. They say, I have hold this opinion because I'm making this assumptions. If this assumption is true, if it's false, we should probably investigate what is the next thing we should pursue or what is a pivot we should make. Have you noticed any uh, difference between reception when you listed those assumptions and then when you're super opinionated? In the beginning for this checkout subscription project, when I wrote down the problems and we should redesign the checkout, I wasn't as thorough um, listing out the assumptions I'm making and I wasn't as thorough putting in the business impact. I think that also was the reason why senior leadership in the beginning said we are not doing this because it was just not thorough enough. It was not painting the whole picture from it's not only visually more pleasing or the interaction will be nicer, but it's good for Shopify and it's good for merchants because of those reasons. And now we can test this assumption first. And I think like we had this assumption that cost clarity is not high enough on the checkout and we need to increase cost clarity. And we added just a timeline feature to the checkout, right? So we just showed, hey, today you're not being charged anything. On this date, you're being charged this amount. And on this date, you're being charged the full amount. That already increased the conversions by, by a lot. The, the culture at Shopify is overwhelmingly high fidelity. Yeah. Executives freak out if you, you show them low fidelity or even mid fidelity wireframes. Yeah. So every designer works very hard to have beautiful pixel perfect mocks all the time. You make a deliberate choice to go against the grain, did very hand wavy drawings in these important vision decks. So can you talk a little bit more about your decision making process and how you pick the right fidelity and the format? Yeah, it's interesting you bring this up because I just last week I had my impact review and this was again pointed out as Hey, we love that you're so scrappy and then you can jump into higher fidelity when we agree on a direction. And I think it's something also I learned at Shopify in a way. John Rundle said he doesn't see a, a huge value in mid fidelity. So he stays low fidelity as long as he can. And then he goes into really, really polished, detailed UI work. And I think I agree a lot. It's something that I did unconsciously before. And once he said it, I felt like, yeah, this is exactly how I want to work. So staying low fidelity allows you to quickly change direction, right? If you figure out along the way, hey, this is not correct. This is not what we should be doing, or we disagree on this. You can have the discussion around the disagreement. You will not spend a ton of time polishing UI that will never see the day of the light. And I think that's exactly what I did in other projects as well. I always have my black notebook close to me because I sketch stuff all the time. And then I just take photos and put them in Figma or in, in a Google Doc and share the, those um, things with people. And then from the sketches, I try to build the UI in a first also scrappy way to maybe run a qualitative test or show it to stakeholders in higher fidelity before figuring out all the details. So I don't see a lot of value in this mid fidelity. And I think also Using pen and paper is, it gives you more freedom in, in expressing what's in your, on your mind, right? If you use a design system, if you use Figma, it imposes some sort of aesthetic on you already because it has defaults and paper gives me like more freedom in thinking. It also helps me, like you, you just see this hand drawing and it will spark a new idea or people will see something in it that I didn't saw before. And they will just say, Hey, look, I imagined this to work like this and it's amazing. And you haven't thought about this. So I think. Figma is already imposing this certain aesthetic and gives you an idea that paper doesn't. I feel like paper is unopinionated in that regard and it sparks more imagination, which I feel is very valuable. Yeah, I agree. I recently signed up for Balsamic <laughs> again. I signed it up because I find, okay, Figma, like they're just screaming for you adding more detail. It's very hard for me to think through on a high level. And Balsamic is now more complicated that I feel like it defeats the purpose of being balsamic. <laughs> and then I come back to pen and paper again. And it liberates you from what you have currently. Yeah. And personally, I'm always drawn to just add some detail, or try something that I, some aesthetic I saw in some app, or it's very easy to add this high fidelity look to something that is very low fidelity on your mind, right? And that's also the reason like pen and paper is one thing, but 
writing as well, I think is so important because your brain gets convoluted with all the context, right? Writing things down and bringing it into a structure helps me also to figure out, hey, what's even going on in my brain when I think about something very early or also later. So just sharing all the write-ups is like, helpful to me. Writing is also a way of prototyping, like just sorting your mind. It's probably the lowest fidelity, but it's also like telling, hey, look, this is the problem we're trying to solve and here are opportunities I see and people can chime in. And before you even start thinking about a solution, it's just, hey, what are the opportunities? What are the possible ways forward? It's the lowest fidelity of prototyping that I can imagine, but I think it's so important. It, at some point in my career, I thought I'm spending too much time writing. Today, I feel this is one of the most important things I, I'm doing because I just feel really how I structure my thinking and figure out, okay, this is really the problem. And at some point, after some hours of writing, I can put the problem in one sentence. And in the beginning, it's 24 bullet points that are very hard to understand. So getting to this one or two sentences, hey, this is the problem. And then from there, you can go and create solutions and figure out, okay, here are opportunities to go forward, building on those assumptions. It also helps my team to keep me honest to the problem we are solving, because I think that it's something that every designer has. You'll really like to seize the opportunity. Hey, while we are working on this, let's do this and this as well, because it's not great how we do it today. So yeah. it's very helpful having this one sentence because it keeps yourself honest on the problem you're really solving and not like getting yeah, into this sense. feature bloat or creep. Yeah, so we don't redesign the app <laughs> yeah. all the time, every time. So in terms of vision, you created this beautiful art craft that's exciting. There's also a socializing aspect. What was your approach? Can yeah, I think that's how, that has evolved a lot over the last years. So in the beginning, when we were in the office, it was very easy to just show people on the hallway. But obviously, when I came to Shopify, that didn't work anymore because you were in San Francisco, I think, back then. Yes. And yes. Yeah. some people were in Toronto, some people were in Europe, some people were in New Zealand. Another designer who's still at Shopify, Kelly Jepson, teach me in a way is recording really good video walkthroughs that really focus on the core. And I have also a way of sharing video walkthroughs. I do them, I do, I think, three or four a week right now to just leave stuff for feedback. But it's also how I share a vision. So I would also first just walk over a video just myself, explaining what I want to say, right? Just to myself. So I have a transcript that I can then shorten down to the most important parts and really extract the essence. So the video then takes maybe five minutes instead of 15 minutes. And then I create a new transcript. I will record another walkthrough without my face because I will always read from the transcript because it's not about me creating a great video for YouTube, but it's um, more about bringing information from person A to person B. So then reading from the script really helps me to not take too much of people's time. So it's really in a short format. It's like three to five minutes that everyone is willing to spend. And then I receive a lot of feedback and I do this for visions. That's the more, the bigger videos where I would spend more time on. When some people are in New York, we are in Europe, then are some people in San Francisco, it's impossible to get everyone in the same Zoom at the same time. So that's really helpful to keep momentum and projects. That was also helpful on the, the retention vision we did back then. We had a video that could just be shared and referenced and yeah, it was there for a very long time. That's a really good tip. One thread that I keep on hearing today is the amount of effort you put in to refine your thinking, like through refining your bullet point into well-written one sentence, distill your entire vision into one idea that keep you honest and focused. And then now you even do the same to write a transcript and stick to the transcript for a work video, yeah. which is very rare. I appreciate the amount of effort and thought you put into everything. Yeah, I think it's part of the reason why, for example, I hate voice messages on WhatsApp or messages because people will tell you, hey, let's meet at 5.30, but they will take one and a half minutes to tell you that. And 
I'm really annoyed when people put in a meeting that could have been an email or a video walkthrough, for example. I try to be very mindful of people's time. I think everyone is always very busy. Everyone has a million things to do. So when I need feedback on something, I want to put the least effort on the recipient. So I put the extra effort in to make it three to five minutes and then make it as easy as possible. And I think it's in a way similar to how I would ship software or any design for that matter, right? I go the extra mile so our customers don't have to do the tedious setup. Feedback is in a way like that's my product to the entire organization and I need something back. I need to convert my feedback request into feedback and my conversion rate is becoming better. It's not where I want it to be, but <laughs> it's good. That's amazing. Growth tactic everywhere. You make everything very compact, polished, intentional. Yeah. I think the intention piece is very, very important. So no matter what you, if you design for the end customer, if you share something for feedback, it needs to be intentional. Otherwise you will lose people immediately, right? Last question about designing and sharing out the vision. So what are some of the common mistakes that you've seen in other designers that might have a good vision, but fail to make that into uh, fruition? Yeah, I wouldn't even point out other designers, but I can really look at my past self, my younger self. It's really when you fail to connect your vision to the business value. It's really hard because oftentimes you don't have the data. You don't know how much revenue you can really attribute to this flow or how much lost deals you can attribute to whatever, right? Because you're oftentimes just designing one part of a bigger whole. And that's what I really appreciated at Shopify is to have data scientists that would support you when you create a vision. Say, hey, if this assumption is correct, we can expect this or that amount of growth or conversion rate increases. It was shockingly accurate as well. So I don't know what kind of black magic data science is, but I was impressed. I don't need to convince a designer often of a better future state, but I need to convince people who have very complex decisions to make, how to allocate headcount to make the business grow or sometimes even just keep it afloat, right? So at Wunder Mobility, sometimes it was really just keeping the lights on if you don't have the data and if you can't really articulate if we do this, we can expect this return on investment or this is important to close this gap and close more deals. If you don't have those insights, then your vision will be something where everyone will tell you, this looks really good, but now let's go back to our roadmap. It needs to be rooted in reality. It needs to be ambitious, uh, but it needs to be rooted in reality in terms of what problems you're trying to solve and also what is your starting point? You're never starting from scratch. So you really need to see, okay, from where we are today, what is one increment that we can extract from this vision to even figure out, is this vision the right one? Is this going in the right direction? I think those are the two pieces that are most important and where I failed in the past to make things happen. Right? What would you do if you don't have the data to help you make the prediction. I mean, that's what, what I, yeah, what I need to try to do right now is I just try to find as much evidence that this problem exists as possible. This can come from, if you have a sales department, it can come from customer success agents. We have integrated like a feedback form in our product so that people, when they are frustrated, they only fill it out when they are frustrated, which is fine. But you get a sense for, okay, look, this comes up in every other feedback request, right? So you have at least an idea that this is a problem worth solving. We cannot attribute conversion rates or lost revenue to this right now, but I'm confident we will get there at some point. But yeah, try to find as much evidence as possible. Try to find uh, qualitative feedback, collect feedback through a forum, talk to your salespeople. What is a common future request that we cannot fulfill today? You will notice themes and sometimes you will be able to connect the dots. And that will help you to articulate some of the design and product decisions. I remember last time we chatted, you mentioned you just pitched you and your skills and services to a local football club. Yeah. More context. I love football. Football <laughs> was always a huge part of my life since I was a small kid. And nobody in my family is actually interested in football, but they make fun that I'm interested enough for all of them. So 
I either play <laughs> football or watch football or play football on a PlayStation or like everything is around football. And my favorite club is like a very, very bad local football club here. They play fourth division. It's down the road. They used to be quite good, quite good, meaning they played in the third division. Back then I was complaining. Now that's like a dream to me. It sounds like a dream to be back in the third division. And this club is struggling a lot. Like there's probably one professional working in the club and the rest, they just spend their free time helping out. Um, there's an average attendance of around 2000 people. But when I was a kid, the average attendance was around eight to 10,000 people. Now that the board changed and they have a vision for the club, I approached them again and said, look, I can help even with graphic design, like in an early stage start, I can help you with so many things that are centered around design and growth. And we can try to increase the attendance in the stadium, increase your following on social media or professionalize the online shop that they just launched on Shopify. And for example, one project we did now, which took a lot of my free time, the stadium will turn a hundred years old in three weeks. And they had nothing to really celebrate that. And they started to organize like an event with a lot of events around the stadium. And what I did is I just designed a collection, um, just merchandise that doesn't look like the typical sports merchandise, but it's something you would wear on an everyday basis because we want to attract more people to the club, also people that are not interested in football. So very soon there will be a collection dropping, which I'm really proud of. And it was also very interesting to work in the constraints, right? There's not a lot of money to spend. So you need to be very intentional again about what design language you choose, what products you, you're going to offer. Um, we did something for the younger audience, but we also did something that is more targeted to the audience 50 plus years old. Right now I'm migrating them off from expensive design software to an online based software that helps them to publish better <laughs> on social media because right now they, they use desktop software. So every time they are on a match day in a stadium, they need to pull out their laptop to create a social media post, put it on their phone to then post it. I think there are way better ways to do it today, which are also cheaper. So we can save them some money and make it more professional. So yeah, that's how I spend my free time right now. And in return, I get to see the matches for free. That's so fascinating. Like, do you think you want to do this just because you want to get involved with your local football club um, or soccer for Yeah, Americans? for the Americans. It's Is that something that you just enjoy? And it's because I know that so this club was very dependent on one investor for a very long time, but this person is, I think now 85 years old, so they won't do it forever. And he also said, look, I can't do this forever. I'm retiring, so I'm not investing as much anymore. And you know, nobody lives forever. So I know that at some point this revenue, if you can call it like that, this money stream will get cut off. And then a lot of football clubs in, in Germany and in Europe overall had this faith already to just go down and cease to exist. And I'm very scared that this club wouldn't exist anymore because, you know, I go there to the matches for 20 plus years. I have so many memories and I really enjoy being there. So I think it's a really good thing to connect. One thing that I enjoy, like bringing growth design into a completely different environment and software to something that means a lot to me. Let's say I would win the lottery, I would probably quit my job and work full time there to just make them grow. I'm pretty sure yeah. with the experience I've had in the past years, I would be able to help increase the match day attendance and social media followers. The stuff they sell on social media or, or on, the, on the online shop would sell probably more because there's so many levers we could still pull. So it's a really good way to connect two things I enjoy doing. I feel like you learn so much about a person by uh, what type of design site project they do. But this is really something I feel very passionate about. And my wife's not too excited because I spend probably too much time and I needed to pause yeah. for a minute, but yeah. Do you spend time with your wife and children? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Especially the weekends are super, super important. But you know, sometimes when kids go to sleep, I still pull out the laptop to work on a side project. So my wife will tell me when I'm doing it too often. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights and about vision and how you work.
It's fascinating. The last portion of this recording is the lightning round. So, are you ready for the rapid fire questions? Let's do it. Okay, great. So, what's your go-to coffee order or workday beverage?、Yeah. I drink cappuccino every morning. Cappuccino is really, really important. And then I'm very boring. I drink water. I love sparkling water. So I think I know this, but digital or analog? Part of both. I, told, I showed you my black book, my notebooks.、So、I、uh-huh. do a lot analog, but I also, especially now with all the AI tools, I'm so curious. So I ask very simple questions to Claude or Perplexity just because I'm curious what will come out of it. And yeah. I'm, I would have a hard time to classify myself as either. Are you an early bird or a night? I sleep in. I'm lucky that my kids sleep in as well, both of them. So the weekends are. Wow. We start them very late. <laughs> hmm. That's very nice. I'm very jealous. What is your design superpower? What is my design superpower? I think the vision work is something I get a lot of feedback on. But what I really felt I can do really, really good is designing with typography only, and I really enjoy doing typographic experiments. So, when I was younger, I was very involved with graffiti as well. Through this, I learned a lot about typography unconsciously, and now even when I was a graphic designer, I very often defaulted to purely typographic visuals instead of fancy illustrations, and I think that's still something I do pretty well. Wow! Do you have your work somewhere online that no, we can see? No, I don't. But my brother does. I can、uh, share his Instagram with you if you want. <laughs> yeah, I'll let him know. <laughs> if you were a designer, what profession would you likely to pursue? That's a funny question. So, as a kid, I wanted to be a bus driver, and the reason for that is my entire family lives in Poland, and we always lived in Germany. And back then, there were no budget flights, so the The way to go to Poland was by bus, which was incredibly long and very tedious. But my thinking as a kid was that when I'm a bus driver, I can be with my mom at home during the week and go to see my grandma during the weekends, and that was what made this job so appealing to me. I loved this job of bus driver because you could combine these two things. And then for a long time, I wanted to be a professional footballer, but I was never talented enough to even get close to getting paid for sports. And I became a designer by accident. If money wouldn't be an issue, I would work for my local football club here. Very nice. What is one design tool or app you can't live without? Yeah, I think pen and paper, <laughs> Google Docs, is really really important.、Um, Figma is great, and I couldn't. Uh, work without Figma. For example, for the merch I did for the football club, I used Figma over Illustrator because I'm so used to it. It's just very simple to to use. But I think all those tools they come and go. The things that constantly are there throughout my career are pen and paper and Google Docs. What is next for you? And is there any way that we can support you in your effort? What is next? So we have a lot of work on the automation side at Personio. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on. How could you help? Like I think if anyone is interested in building automation tools in the context of HR, which sounds more boring than it actually is, it's actually really interesting. We have some roles open. We hire in the U.S. and in Europe, mainly in New York, but there are also some people in San Francisco. So yeah, if you're passionate about automations, reach out. That would be amazing. I think those are top of mind to me. Advancing automations at Personio and my project. Thank you so much again, Carol, for joining us today. I learned a lot, and then I'm sure everyone else does too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to see you again. If you enjoyed listening to this episode. I think you might also like my interview about Amplitude's redesign with Will Newton. We dive into the behind-the-scenes challenges and breakthroughs, and is packed with insights that could really inspire your own approach to redesign projects. So I hope I can see you there.